A reading from the book of Revelation. War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels battled against the dragon. The dragon and its angels fought back, but they did not prevail. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. The huge dragon, the ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceived the whole world, was thrown down to earth, and its angels were thrown down with it. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have salvation and power come, and the kingdom of our God, and the authority of his anointed. For the accuser of our brothers is cast out, who accuses them before our God day and night. They conquered him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. Love for life did not deter them from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell therein. Ebum Domini.
ministers who do his Dominus Vobiscum, Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Johannem, Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Here is a true child of Israel. There is no duplicity in him. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, I saw you under the fig tree. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. And he said to him, Amen, amen, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Verbum Domini. Today we celebrate the feast of the archangels, Michael, Gabriel, Raphael. And this first reading we have from the book of Revelation is about the great battle that took place where Michael drew, drove out uh, Lucifer and all the rebellious angels. We have to remember that angels are purely spiritual beings. They belong to the invisible creation we say in the creed that God's the maker of things visible and invisible. This is part of the unseen, the invisible. But yet they're part of creation. They're not necessary beings, so to speak. Uh, God created them. And they, are, they appear throughout uh, scripture, carrying out fundamental tasks in the name of God himself, helping to bring fulfillment, the kingdom of God, moments in creation, salvation history, you know, in the life of Christ, the annunciations of the birth of Jesus, of John the Baptist, um, other, especially at the cross, the resurrection, and the second coming, and even the book of Revelation and the book of the heavenly liturgy, we see angels um, there as well. And in this chapel, Mother Angelica, in the great uh, Franciscan tradition, put angels all over the place. I've never counted them, but they're <laughs> all over. And it's, it expresses the reality at the heavenly liturgy, there are a multitude of angels. Scripture uh, names different, I guess we could say, kinds of angels. Uh, Colossians speaks of thrones, dominions, principalities, authorities. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas grouped them, drawing from Scripture, and St. Gregory the Great, uh, the seraphim, cherubim, the thrones, in one hierarchy. Uh, dominions, virtues, powers in a second, and principalities, archangels, and angels in the lower realm, actually. So in this great battle we hear in the first reading, uh, the church fathers believed that Satan, Lucifer, was in one of the higher levels, and Saint Michael, an archangel, is actually in a lower level. And God used this uh, to humiliate Lucifer and his rebellion. He had a lower angel, the church fathers believed, you know, cast him out of heaven. But we see that they are purely spiritual beings. God is pure spirit, and he's reflected especially in these spiritual beings and angels. We could say that they are nearer to God, to his throne. You know, some of the, some of the groups of angels are called the thrones of God, that they are there in the heavenly throne room, closer to God, they reflect him in a special way, more so even than material creatures. So as spiritual beings, they have an intellect 
and a free will. They're intellectual beings. They're free beings. They're called to know the truth and to love the good freely. It belongs to the nature of love to have that freedom. So clearly, though, we see in this first reading from Revelation 12 that there is a fall, that there is good angels and bad angels. And, and this means that that fall involves a choice due to their freedom that with angelic beings, it's, angelic beings, it's an irreversible choice. They have this intellectual intelligence, much greater than ours, much more radical in its choice, permanent choice for or against God. They know God in a more penetrating way, a more essential, direct way, a more perfect way. So there isn't a redemption for them per se. They made their choice with full knowledge of the extent of the ramifications, consequences of their choice. They're not moved uh, by passion and uh, their intelligence, as I said, much greater than ours and, and makes this permanent, decisive choice. The fallen ones made a choice against God himself. They wanted to, church fathers believed, to, to share in the divine nature, where the, the good angels entered into that beatific vision by choosing for God, and they entered in. The, the, the fallen angels decided were jealous of God or in their pride turned against God, and they did not enter into that beatific vision. But I like to announce the good news every week. The bad news is they were thrown down to heaven, I mean, to, to earth. So we have to deal with them down here. They did not enter into that beatific vision. The church fathers understood this rebellion as a blindness caused by their pride. Pride and envy were the two sins available to these purely spiritual beings. So scripture speaks of you know, Lucifer's sin as being one of envy, but certainly we could speak of pride mixed in there as well. As well. Some of the church fathers saw that it was revealed to them the coming incarnation, God's plan um, for salvation, and they rebelled against that because the incarnation would join the spiritual and the material. They're purely spiritual. They're higher than the material world. And so they were intoxicated by their own perfection, and they wanted to be like God or take the place of God, we could say. And that plan of incarnation involves Mary as God's mother, and she too would be elevated above the angels. So this is believed to have triggered their rebellion. Jeremiah 2.20 uses a phrase that we attribute to, to Satan's, to his uh, motto, I will not serve. I will not serve. This is believed to be Lucifer's cry. You know, Lucifer, the name means light bearer, possibly the highest of angels, turns away from God. I will not serve God. I will not serve the good. Mother Angelica put it beautifully. She said, the angel of light became the angel of darkness, you know, turning from God, thrown down to earth to oppose God, to pursue the woman and her child, we hear in Revelation 12, an image of the church, an image of Mary, raging against God wherever he finds his image. Ultimately, he is behind every assault on human dignity, human life. He assaults all the good rooted in our human nature as created by God. Seeing that image of God, especially in us, in that given human nature, raging against marriage, family, sexuality, our bodies, which our bodies participate in that image and likeness of God as well, not just our souls. And he says, I will not serve this plan of God. I will rebel, rage against it, and try to destroy it. And <clears throat> it's vicious. It's completely, he's given completely over to evil and he's prowling the earth you know, like a roaring lion. Well, the good news part of this is that Michael is on the scene and the other archangels. As I said, he's considered one of the 
lower angels, the lower rung of angels. But his motto is, his name means, who is like God? Lucifer is trying to become God or become like God, share in the divine nature. Michael is God's defender, proclaiming who else is like God? Who, you know, I want to serve God. I'll serve the good. And Gabriel, another archangel, we see that he is bound to the link to the incarnation, the different annunciations of John the Baptist and of Jesus. His name means my power is God. Raphael means God is God heals. We see him in the book of Tobit, and especially uh, children there are entrusted uh, to Raphael, to his protection. So these angels are given to us to help us to possess salvation, to help, you know, in that plan of salvation, in this difficult struggle that we're in. Satan's thrown down to earth. In scripture, he's spoken of as the accuser who denies the truth about God. John 8 calls him the father of lies. He lies about the good, distorts the good. He's a murderer from the beginning, meaning he destroys the good. First John 5 speaks of the fact that the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. I think we often forget that. You know, as the, the world can dress itself up as so enticing, intoxicating, attractive as, a, as a, a good path for us to take. And we forget Satan's influence on it. But the good news today, though, is that Satan is not infinite. He's only a creature. He and his minions, they're, they're creatures. That Michael won the first battle in heaven. Jesus has won the definitive battle, the definitive victory over sin and death. And not only that, as we saw the other day in the readings, when he sends out the 12, he gives authority to his disciples over the demons. He shares that power. We see that in the church's, uh, the rite of exorcism. We see that in any prayer that we have, especially prayer to St. Michael and our struggle against evil or against the evil one. He's given the authority to the church, you know, sharing in this victory over evil, that if we come to the sacraments, if we just bathe ourselves in the word of God and the scriptures and the truth of the gospel, participate in the sacraments, have a real prayer life, come to adoration, repent of sin, that that protects us from all this onslaught of evil. And on top of that, Genesis 3.15, you know, in God addressing Satan himself, speaks of this enmity between him and the woman. That's a prophecy, the first gospel, the Proto-Evangelium of Mary, that she will be at odds with Satan, that she, he will have no part of her, sin will have no part of her. She's the Immaculate Conception. She is, in the scriptures, described as full of grace, Revelation 12 speaks of the dragon, Satan, pursuing the woman, but the woman's protected. He goes off to make war on her offspring, those who keep the commandments, who give witness testimony to Jesus. But she is clearly there to help, to protect us, to guide us, to help us to hold on to that grace we're given in the sacraments, that grace we're given through faith in the word of God. She helps us in this struggle, the lowly woman, the humble woman. So let us have that humility of a Michael, of a Mary, uh, to trust God, to live in his grace, and not to give in to the evil one.